I'm going to present some work I did uh, in collaboration with uh, Michal Oshmaniek, Nina Dangniam, who work at the Polish Academy of Sciences, and Sultan Simboras, who is in the Wigner Center for Physics in Hungary. Um, our work is currently in the archive. Uh, it's under review, so hopefully it will be published soon. Um, so our work is essentially about uh, these quantum supremacy uh, sampling schemes or algorithms. So the most known is boson sampling. Uh, so my presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what we, the ingredients that are required to show uh, uh, quantum supremacy using sampling. Uh, I'll try to go uh, slowly. So for those who are not too much into the math of it, but the talk will be mostly theoretical. And I'll try to make some connections to, to possible experiments. Um, so what's the motivation of this, where it's, it's, it's the idea of having uh, quantum supremacy and what, what is that? Well, the, the quantum supremacy is the goal to perform some, uh, some ex experiment in which a, per, a computational task is performed uh, and for which classical computers cannot perform this task uh, in, some, in some reasonable time. Uh, now we know that the current computers we have are very noisy, very small, and the number of qubits, it's, it's very, very small. And moreover, uh, if we were going to run an algorithm on these computers, uh, we would like some theoretical guarantee that what the algorithm we are running is actually infeasible for classical computers. Um, so one idea is, for example, to run Shor's algorithm. So most of you must have heard about Shor's algorithm. Uh, about uh, factorizing uh, numbers into their prime decomposition. Uh, the problem of this, uh, of this uh, approach is that currently uh, we require too many qubits to perform it uh, for it to be useful at all, uh, or at least to have some advantage with, uh, with respect to classical computers. So here I'm showing some work uh, done by Craig Gidney and Martin Ekera. Um, where clearly the number of qubits is too high. So they assume some uh, physical gate error and uh, using an part, some particular error correction technique and they can compute that the amount of qubits requires is 20 million. So clearly this is out of reach. Uh, this, is, this is not possible nowadays. Uh, some other approach, which is quite popular nowadays, is using variational algorithms. So what are these variational algorithms? Well, the idea is that um, suppose we have some, some objective function, some cost function that we want to minimize. This could be, for example, we, can, we want to minimize uh, the energy in some Hamiltonian. We want to find the, the ground state. The idea is that uh, starting from some standard state and using some circuit, which depends on parameters, we generate an ansatz. So we, for example, start each of these parameters over here randomly. Uh, we generate some, run, some, uh, some ansatz state, and then we measure, for example, in the computational basis. And after having measured in this basis, we can compute this cost function. And uh, so for example, the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian and then uh, using an optimizer, a classical optimizer, we tweak the parameters in this, uh, in this circuit in order to minimize the, the cost function even more. So this, this, all these uh, sequences repeated several times, shown here. Um, and in this way, we can optimize uh, anything. <laughs> now, there are two very popular algorithms that perform this kind of procedure. One is QAOA. So this is used with uh, diagonal Hamiltonian. So the idea is we have some optimization problem, for example, uh, traveling salesman problem is the most known or some other. And, and you try to minimize it in this fashion. Or for example, you could perform EQE, variational quantum eigen solver. Uh, so the idea is that you have some Hamiltonian, for example, about some, some, from some, uh, chemical molecule or some condensed matter system. And the idea is you want to find the ground state. And then you, you, found, you find it 
performing this, this kind of uh, minimization. Uh, now, this, uh, the, the problem that this has is that there are no strong guarantees that there is any advantage with respect to uh, using classical computers. So we, we have no proof that this is actually faster in any way for performing the optimizations and also, for example, for, for the optimization of uh, the traveling salesman problem, we have many heuristics in, in the classical case. So, so, so we don't know if we're actually beating all of them by doing this. Uh, despite the lack of these guarantees, uh, experiments have been performed uh, on these two approaches, QAOA and VQE. Uh, so for example, uh, Google performed these two uh, experiments a while ago, one on, uh, well, both of them on their superconducting quantum computers. Uh, VQE, they performed Hartree fog simulations and on the for QAOA, they, they solve some graph problems. Uh, I'm not going into the detail of them, but, but you can check these papers for more details. But anyway, the problem is that we don't have the guarantees that we would like with these variational algorithms. And this is how we arrive to the idea of doing sampling problems. So as I said, we have two requirements for quantum supremacy. One is the this, this strong guarantee that, that we have advantage, and the other is that we want to implement it in near-term hardware. So uh, here I'm showing what the, the, the famous experiment by Google, um, random circuit sampling. And essentially the idea is that um, you start in some reference state, and then you perform, uh, they, they, what they do is they perform layers uh, of single qubit gates and then two qubit gates. But these gates are chosen randomly from some fixed uh, gate set. And after uh, running this random circuit, they, they measure in the, in, the, in the computational basis. Now, the idea is that the, the uh, probability distribution that one is sampling from using the quantum computer, uh, it's hard for classical computers. And what I mean with hard is that uh, performing the same sampling task with a classical computer is not feasible, cannot be done uh, efficiently. Um, so there, are, uh, there, there have been many sampling schemes created, not only Google. So, well, one is the random circuit sampling um, that I just mentioned. And the other one is uh, boson sampling and it's, uh, near causing Gaussian boson sampling, which was also recently performed. Um, now boson sampling is based, as it says on, on uh, as it says in the name, it's based on, on, on photonics. And that, the, basically the idea is the same. You also always have your reference state, some random circuit, and then you sample from it, which is going to be hard from, to simulate. Um, now, the question I always had when I started learning about this is, well, if we have some boson sampling, what about fermions? Can we do it with fermions? Uh, and actually some people before me, of course, had thought about this, obviously. Uh, there is some work by the group by, from the group in uh, Cambridge, where they've studied the, the computational power of, of what, they call, what is called match gates. Um, but still, in, so in this work, they, they, they study and they find that yes, some, some similar results can be found, but they still didn't, uh, didn't push it all the way to the guarantees that are required for, a, for let's say an experiment, for to actually claim in an experiment, yes, we have uh, quantum supremacy. So the whole idea of our work was to, to, to uh, prove all these required ingredients for, for, for claiming quantum supremacy if you were going to do it with fermions. Um, so the, this, all these ingredients is what I'm going to show to you. Um, but before some, uh, a bit of theoretical background for sampling problems. So a, a relevant, uh, so here I'm going to call P of X the, always the, the probability distribution of the sample, of the samples you get from your quantum computer. And uh, I'm going to call a relative approximation, uh, what is shown right here. So it's, uh, so Q approx relatively approximates P if 
uh, the, 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 by a factor epsilon is, is uh, they are near each other by a fraction of p. And I'm going just to call it additive approximation in the common sense that it's probably reasonable to you. So these are two related notions of approximation that will be relevant. Now, of course, um, in, a in a sampling, when you're sampling from your quantum computer, there's always noise. Uh, so it's relevant that um, the, the additive approximation is what's relevant here, right? Because uh, the, the noise will always mess up the, the probability distribution that you're expecting from the computer. Um, and so what's, what's here, um, what, what, what's important here to prove this quantum advantage? And here I will use a weird word, which I will explain later. But the idea is that, um, the idea is that if there was a classical machine or a computer that we know that is given a description of the unitary that you're applying uh, with your quantum computer, uh, and suppose that machine was able to sample these x's, these outputs from a distribution q that additively, additively approximates p, plus some conjectures that I mentioned later, then something very weird happens. Okay, so if you don't understand this, I will explain it later, but something weird happens. And these weird things, uh, complexity theories believe that that uh, doesn't, uh, is not true. So since we believe that this is not true, then we believe that this thing over here, that the classical machine can sample from this probability distribution is false as well. So this is, this is the essential idea of, of proving supremacy. Um, so some results, there are some results on additive approximation. The, some first results were by Aronson and Arkhipov, Arkhipov with, uh, um, Boson sampling and also Bremner, Montana, and Shepard with uh, IQP circuits. So these these were the first um, kind of sampling problems that appeared in the literature. And okay, so now to explain to you uh, how we set out to prove these things, I'm obligated to show you a bit of complexity theory. So bear with me for a second. Uh, so I hope you've heard of the class P. This is a class of decision problems, computational problems, uh, which can be decided efficiently in, with classical computers. So this means in polynomial time. Uh, there is another class that hopefully you've heard of and P. Uh, the idea is that these problems can be checked efficiently. So if I give you the solution of a problem, uh, so a traveling salesman problem, I, I give you, I give you some, uh, particular path that the salesman has to travel around, then you, are, you can check the, the solution. Um, and then BPP is a class of decision problems that can be decided um, when, the, when the classical computer is supplied with randomness, with random bits. So yeah, these are the basic classes we have, but then there are some uh, more strange. So before I mentioned the polynomial, or it appeared in the screen something called the polynomial hierarchy, and this will be relevant uh, because what I said is that if a classical computer could sample from probability distributions as the ones that quantum computers can generate, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses. That's what it said. What is this polynomial hierarchy? Okay, so suppose I were to create this. Um, different, put these different classes in a diagram, okay? So focus first on P, which I already mentioned, and then P. Then I can also create uh, something that complexity theories do is they create uh, machines that are able to call as subroutines other machines. So for example, this thing over here, NP to the NP are machines that solve problems in NP that can call as subroutines other machines with power to solve problems in MP. And we can do this uh, more and more. It seems like we can play this game infinitely and create this infinite set of, of, of classes. Uh, I just want you to focus on this one in particular on this, on this thing I've uh, highlighted in red. Uh, so this, is a, this, this forms a hierarchy, right? So, so P is inside NP and in P is inside NP to the NP, et cetera. Um, we don't know. We don't know if 
P is equal to NP, and we don't know if NP is equal to NP to the MP. And likewise, we don't know it for any what is called level of this hierarchy. So, so th these things we don't know. This potentially all these things over here and this whole diagram is just one class. We we just don't know it. What we do believe is that they are different. They, we don't, and that is this is what we mean that it doesn't collapse. So, okay, don't mind that recursion over there. So polynomial hierarchy is going to def be defined as the union of all the things uh, in this diagram, essentially. That's how I'm defining it. And uh, we're going to say the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the i-th level if uh, the polynomial hierarchy is inside one of these elements in the, in the hierarchy. So if the polynomial hierarchy is inside, the, if all the polynomial hierarchy is inside this, then we say it collapses to the second level, for example. Um, I hope I, I, if you have a question, please ask me. So don't be shy about it. But that's the essential idea. And then there's a, a, a bigger class or a bit bigger class, which is P with to the sharp P. So what, what does that mean even? So sharp P are just essentially they represent problems that we can count the solution of. So um, so for example, in the counting version of Charlie Salesman problem is counting the different number of, of, of paths that the salesman could follow, for example. Uh, and then what I'm writing as P to the sharp P is just uh, machines that can solve, uh, that can run in polynomial time and that have access to subroutines that can count solutions of problems. This is, this is the idea. Um, now there are uh, there are things called complete problems. These are the hardest problem in a class. So an unknown Sharpie complete problem is uh, the permanent. So the permanent uh, it's uh, it's given some matrix in M. You you can compute the permanent is similar to the determinant. If you I guess you know the determinant, and except that you don't have the negative sign when you're computing each of the columns, if you remember how to compute the term. So, and this thing, like computing this permanent can be related to counting uh, perfect matchings in bipartite graphs. And this can be proven to be uh, hard in the Sharpie class. So, okay, that was a lot of info. Uh, okay, there's a BQP, just so you know, this is very, we don't know exactly where it is. So I draw it like that. Uh, but that, that's all the complexity classes we need today. Uh, so let's go back to sampling. So, so I said boson sampling was one of the first ones to be proposed um, by Aronson and Arkhipov. Uh, what do, what the essential idea is the same I explained before. So you, you have some this input state over here, uh, which is non-Gaussian. So it, it has n photons in n modes. And then you act with, uh, with linear optics. So essentially these are uh, operators that act linearly on the creation and destruction operators. And then the idea is that the, the, the states you get as outputs, the, the, the amplitudes of these states can be written in terms of permanence of a matrix. And this matrix are, is a, a, a sub matrix of the unitary you're applying on the circuit. Okay, so so as I mentioned the permanent before in the you remember I mentioned it in the sharp P class is hard, it's hard for uh, for uh, because it's related to counting right and the idea is that this hardness of computing the permanent can be related to the fact that it's hard to sample. These are two different things, but they are related, and I will show how uh, later in more detail. But you have to keep this in mind. So, okay, so I mentioned this is boson sampling, and now I want to use boson, uh, fermion, sorry. Uh, so, briefly stated, this is the Hilbert space of fermions. So, it's uh, the tensor sum of uh, antisymmetric spaces. This just means you can exchange fermions and a negative sign appears. This is just a more complicated way of saying it. Um, and of course, we all know these uh, fermions are described by creation and destruction operators with uh, anti-commutation relations. This is what defines them. 
Alternatively, we can define what is called Majorana operators, and we can use these operators to also describe uh, the states in what is called the Fox space. This is the Hilbert space of the fermions. Uh, so this is one example of a Fox basis state. And then one, one way of acting over these, uh, over these fermions is using passive FLO, so fermionic, passive fermionic linear optics. So this is like the bosonic linear optics I showed before, which acts uh, linearly on the creation and destruction operators. And uh, the unitaries are particle number preserving. So these are unitaries that the, the evolution, if it's written as the exponential of a Hamiltonian, then the Hamiltonian is quadratic in this creation and destruction operators, but has to preserve particle number. Uh, a second way, uh, is active fermionic linear optics. So the idea is that these, these operators now act linearly on the Majorana operators. Uh, and now this preserves the parity of the, of, uh, of the number of fermions in your, that are in your fog basis state. So this can be written as uh, the, the Hamiltonians that generate this evolution can be written as uh, quadratic in Majorana operators. Uh, and essentially they, 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 they form a representation of the SO group, whereas in the passive case is the unitary group. Uh, and during this, so during my presentation, I will show Fermi on sampling. We showed that the um, supremacy scheme works for both cases, for both passive and, and active. So you can actually think of active as a sort of analogous to Gaussian boson sampling. Uh, or Gaussian operation, uh, operations over bosons, if you know them. So, okay, what about fermion sampling? Now that we know what are fermions. Um, so I mentioned already what passive FLO is. And uh, suppose we use the same input state that I showed you for boson sampling. And we know then that the unit, if we use a passive FLO, this will act linearly, and it, you can actually show that given this input, then the output uh, uh, probabilities will be written in terms of determinants. Uh, this, is, this is actually a, a problem because uh, determinants are easy to compute, unlike permanents. So permanents are hard, as I said before, and this is an ingredient that is necessary for the sampling to be hard. But since the determinant is easy to compute, then the sampling is, uh, we cannot show that the sampling is hard. So it seems that uh, at this uh, at first sight, it seems it doesn't work. Uh, in the case of active SLO, uh, which are also called match gates, if you've heard about it, there are, there, are, there are ways to simulate efficiently the operation of match gates. Uh, and, and there's other conditions, which I'll mention briefly. But the point is that what I'm trying to tell you here is that both passive and active SLO are easy to sample if the input is of this form. Actually, if it is any, uh, if it can be written in like a tensor product in this sense, it will always be easy. So there is a problem with the input. Uh, so and what is the problem? The problem is that in the case of boson sampling, the input that I show, so this one over here, is non-Gaussian. So there is a, it has a, a magic, there's some magic in the input, Say in some sense that makes the sampling hard, but this this same state for fermions is Gaussian, so it makes everything Gaussian. It makes everything easy to sample. So what we have to do is input some magic into it. To say in some sense, and uh, these are the states we chose. Um, so we 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 define these quadruplets and we we just inject many of these quadruplets uh, in the fermion sampling, and then you can add with either. Uh, active or passive FLO, and then you sample in the number particle basis. This will then generate some uh, probability distribution, and this probability is hard to sample from classical. Uh, now, what about how do this output probability looks look like? So in the passive case, it was shown previously, uh, and which are, this result actually inspired our work uh, in some sense, uh, the probability output distribution looks 
as a sum of determinants. Now, I said before, the determinant is easy to compute. Now, this is a sum over determinants. It's, it's, it's a sum over determinants of submatrices of the big unitary. And this actually can be shown to reduce uh, to computing permanence. Sorry, you can reduce computing the permanent to this thing over here. So this is at least as hard as computing permanence. In the active case, we show as well that uh, it has uh, also some form which is related to Hafnians. This is another thing uh, that can be computed on matrices. And each of these two, the, the, the sum over determinants over Hafnians have their own uh, graph theoretical interpretation, as, as well as I said before, the permanent has an interpretation, these ones as well. Uh, but the point is that these two probabilities, probability distributions are hard uh, to compute. So this at least tells us that sampling may be hard as well. Um, now about the op active and passive operations, um, just as in the Bosonic case, we can do the same, the compositions that are known for optics. So there is no problem with this. And also about the physical implementation. So, um, so actually the gates, for pass the gates for passive and active FLOs are quite easy to implement in superconductors. Like the, so the root square of ISWAP and all these single qubit operators are very hard to, very easy to implement, uh, which makes it very convenient as well. So in this sense, uh, we, 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 we always thought of this fermion sampling as a sort of uh, intermediate option between cir random circuit sampling and, and boson sampling. And as I'll show later, we get many of the benefits of both uh, um, implementations. So, okay, so what are the results we show? So now I showed you what fermion sampling is. Um, and the idea is that we show three main results in our work. Um, so this two first over here, what is called anti-concentration and the average case Sharpie hardness are the hardness guarantees. So this, these two things guarantee that sampling from this, uh, well, this guarantee provided some, con um, some conjectures show that sampling from these things is hard. And this, Last result is um, there, it says that there's some efficient certification for the for the for the circuits. Now this is uh, this is interesting because it's not present in, in other schemes. In, in, I mean, in random circuit sampling, um, because we are essentially using active and passive FLO. So it's, it's easy to check uh, what unitaries are you applying. Now this certification. Uh, so here I put in square quotes. It's not the same as the cross linear entropy certification. If you know about supermassive, I'm not referring to that. I'm just referring about checking the circuit. What what circuits actually are you implementing in the in the scheme? Um, so yeah, we, we we show that this can be done efficiently and easily. And actually, we have we improved this result uh, to log to logarithmic now. Um, but I'm showing what we have in the paper here. Um, but yeah, so we, we can perform a certification. That's fine. I think I'll jump this for now. And uh, I'll go to the two, uh, let's say more, more important results of the hardness guarantees. And I'll explain what these two things over here mean. What, what is anti-concentration and what is average case hardness. Uh, so, as I've tried, as I've repeatedly said, hardness of computing probability uh, outputs, the probabilities, in the worst case is not the same as the hardness of sampling from them. So I just told you that the probabilities are hard to compute, but not to sample. So how do we prove they're hard to sample from? Uh, so here's the scheme trying to show you how that is shown. Um, the, the, the key here is that we want to go from efficiently sampling from a distribution to showing that the polynomial hierarchy collapses, okay? So we want to show that this happens and since this thing over here is crazy, no one believes it happens, then, well, there's some people who believe, but it, it, it's unlikely. So then we think that this thing over here is unlikely as well. 
Uh, so how do we do this? So the first thing we do is that we show that the efficient sampling can be reduced to a relative approximation of the probability. And this is done on average. With on average, I mean for a fraction of these probabilities. So to do this, we use something called Stockmeyer algorithm. And this is common to all uh, uh, the sampling schemes. This is all of them prove it in this way. Uh, so the idea of the Stockmeyer is that uh, if you're given some function, linear function, and some uh, output of the function, then there is some machine that uses randomness with access to, uh, with Oracle access to the function and to subroutines that solve problems in MP, then you can approximate uh, the probability that the function outputs Y, okay? So, so if you didn't understand what I said, the important thing is that you can relatively approximate uh, the probabilities. Of, of this function. And of course, if I have a machine that can efficiently sample on distribution, then I can use that as my function f. And it means I can relatively approximate. Um, so now an important thing is that uh, this, is a much, this is a strange machine. This is not a, your normal desktop uh, classical machine. This is a machine that has access to subroutines that solve problems in NP. So that means that this thing over here, this VBB machine with this access, lives on the third level of the polynomial hierarchy. Um, this is because it has been shown that VPP to the NP is inside the third level. Uh, so I know this is a bit abstract, but, but uh, bear with me for a second. So that's the first thing. But the other thing is that, as I said, we needed to do, we need to perform this relative approximation on average, and that's why we use anti-concentration. So what, what, what is this anti-concentration? Um, so anti-concentration, what it's saying is essentially that the probabilities, the, the output probabilities of the circuits are not too, uh, not too small, let's say, so they are not like, to small probability so that if, if there was a probability that was hard to compute, I could, it could turn out that for some circuit, the probability of that probability output is very, very small, right? What I'm saying with this is uh, that actually the sort of the, all the, all the outputs are, have some share of the weight of the probability. And this happens for a fraction of the, of the circuits. And this is, this is what allows you to say that this approximation that you do with Stockmeyer is actually on average, and it's not just for some particular probability, if it makes sense. Um, then we want to connect this to the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. And this is also common to all uh, sampling schemes. So um, one key ingredient is Toda's theorem. Uh, the idea is that the polynomial hierarchy lives inside p to the sharp p. So if you recall, this is this computer with access to subroutines that count solutions of problems. And uh, since we know that this strange machine is in the third uh, level, which is the one we use in Stockmeyer's algorithm, then together with Toda's theorem, what we've effectively shown is that uh, it collapses the, the polynomial hierarchy. Because what we are showing is that we can, with this machine, we can compute things in P to the sharp P, right? Because that's what we use the Stockmeyer algorithm to compute the probabilities, the probability outputs, which I told you were hard to compute. So what you've essentially shown is that the polynomial hierarchy is inside the third level. And uh, that's how the polynomial hierarchy collapses. Um, there's also, uh, sorry, there's also a conjecture here. Um, the conjecture is that the is the average case hardness of approximating the, the the probability outputs. So they are hard to compute in the worst case, as in the permanent I told you. But in the average case, means that for a fraction, for a large fraction of them, it's hard to compute. This is not the same statement, right? Because there could be an instance that is very very hard, but all the others are easy. But the conjecture is that that's not true. The conjecture is that for a large fraction of, for example, permanents 
these are hard to approximate to a relative error. Um, and no one has proven this conjecture for any of the, of the sampling schemes. What people do instead is that they prove that uh, they prove the average case hardness of approximating up to an additive error of which is exponential two to the minus poly n. Um, so if this were, why do they prove this instead? Because if this happened to be two to the minus n, then that's equivalent to the conjecture. So you try to get this polynomial as the, as small as possible, and, and 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 the smaller that is, the more robust your your sampling scheme is to uh, to error, for example. Uh, so these are all the ingredients that come up into a sampling scheme, and this is every sampling scheme has to go through these and, and, and prove these, these results at the concentration and the average case hardness to, to, to claim that this is at this robust. Um, now, a key thing here is the anti-concentration because in, this is known for random circuit sampling, uh, but it's not known for boson sampling actually. And this is why I'm saying all the time like, Fermion sampling is like a middle option between random circuit and boson sampling because uh, the, the surprising result of us of ours was that, that we actually could prove anti concentration. So we have anti concentration. We have uh, certification schemes that are not in random circuit sampling but are in boson sampling, and uh, then then we we, we we get the best of both worlds in a sense. Um, so now I, I'll explain essentially those two results I mentioned. So what, what is anti-concentration or, well, I, I said what it is. Um, I won't go into much detail of the proof, but if you have, if you're wondering how we prove it, you can ask me. Um, the idea do, though is that we strongly use uh, representation theory in the proof. So all, like all anti-concentration proofs, Proofs we use something called the Paley Sigmund inequality, and uh, essentially the, the, these techniques. Uh, so the, the idea is that fermions are very convenient in representation theory, um, in the sense that there are some the, the coherent states are very easy to manipulate, and that helps us to prove them to concentration. But uh, anyway, I don't want to go into depth. But if you're curious, please ask me. Uh, what about the average case hardness? So just a bit more detail. Um, so the idea is that you start from a worst case circuit. So as I said, um, for example, in boson sampling, you have a circuit, which is worst case hard, like it outputs probabilities, uh, samples with probabilities that are hard to compute in the worst case. So let's call that circuit C. And then we're going to sort of perturb the circuit. And show that these perturbed circuits should also be hard, and in that case, prove average case hardness. So let's take this brick wall ar architecture and let's take the circuit that is worst case. And now we are going to perturb it. So the idea is that um, you choose some random Hermitian operators, you take some parameter theta. Uh, and this f is uh, this is a Cayley function. The idea is that it maps Hermitian operators to unitary, so this thing is a unitary, and this unitary is perturbing the the original circuit uh, in terms of theta. Um, and this uh, we can also then parameterize the probability the, the probabilities of the outputs in terms of theta, uh, which actually define a polynomial. So the idea is that now we can, this, this theta, this knob, we can tune it and we will get a path through uh, to the space of different circuits. Now, um, so you have over here, this P of zero, this is the worst case circuit because when theta is zero, you, got, you get back the original worst case circuit, of course. And then as you change theta, um, you know, you get, you, you get some curve and the idea is that you can show that um, for, suppose you start sampling thetas near one, you can show that, this, that you are actually sampling uh, circuits from the random hard distribution. So just, just by choosing thetas here randomly, 
you you're you're act what you're you're almost choosing uh, higher random circuits. And then the idea of this is that um, you 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 sample many thetas here. Uh, you and you, you assume you can compute the probabilities. So you assume that suppose in the average case, or that suppose for a fraction of these circuits, I can compute the, the output probabilities. Some will be correct, some will be incorrect. But the point is that if I compute enough of them correctly, then I can use polynomial interpolation and get the worst case probability. And as I said, that's hard, that's sharply hard. So what this reduction is showing is that if I were capable of computing for a large fraction output probabilities for any circuit, for random circuits, then I will be able to do it for the worst case. But since we know the worst case is sharply hard, then doing this must be also sharply hard. Uh, so hope that makes sense. But this is essentially how you prove average case hardness uh, results. Uh, now, in our case, um, so the technique I showed before, I referenced, well, maybe I didn't mention, but this is by Bulan, Fesserman, Mirke, Vazirani, and Movasag. They did this for random circuit something, and we had to adapt this technique to our case. So uh, in our case, um, the, the, the issue we had, quote unquote issue, was that uh, we were working at the group level. We were not working at the level of circuits. So we had to modify the technique to work with any group whatsoever. You know, it doesn't matter if it's unitary or if it's SO or whatever. So we generalized it. So this, this mapping I showed you before, which is the Cayley map, uh, you, you can define it in the, the level of the group or any Lie algebra. Um, and then this 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 mapping generates a a path, but this time on both the group and the Lie algebra. Um, and I don't want to get like go down to all the details, but the, the the point is essentially the same. So you you get this path, and then you assume this G zero is the hard group element of the of all the group, and then you sample near a G one, and then you prove that you are essentially sampling like randomly over all the group. Uh, so as I said, we rather than perturb the circuit, we perturb at the group level. Um, so it's a slight change and it generalizes, generalizes it. And then the, the end result of all this, uh, just to not go too much into detail, is that it is sharply hard to approximate uh, the probability outputs, the out, output probabilities uh, to an accuracy that is exponential minus n to the six. With some probability, with some big, pro large probability. So this is uh, what I showed you before. Was the instead of proving the conjecture, this is what you prove. So two to the minus poly n. Um, now after we like right after we publish or almost simultaneously, um, there were other results. So well, pre pre previous to what we did, Boasak has shown for. Uh, Random circuit sampling, this, this error. So it was a bit better than ours. Uh, and just to remind you, we need to prove, to prove the conjecture, we need two to the minus n. So th this is what is required. So we are, we are almost there. And this is what actually very recent work by Bulan et al and Kondo et al have done. So the, the techniques they use actually apply for our case as well. And what they have shown is that the, the, the error for the hardness that they have shown is two to the minus n log n. So this is like almost there, except by a logarithmic factor. And uh, I mean, that, that makes it, uh, makes you hope that maybe this will be proven, but we'll see. It seems very hard. It's, it, it seems that very different techniques from the things I've shown here are required. So we'll have to see about that. So just to recap a bit what, what I showed you, I showed you the ingredients that we require for the quantum supremacy. So these were the anti-concentration, that the probabilities are not too small, um, the average case hardness, Sharpie hardness of the probabilities. Uh, I told you about the certification, this very simple certification we had, and also that it's experimentally feasible. 
so I showed you that the same decompositions that work for our system, uh, sorry, that work for uh, boson sampling work for our case. And actually this come into an in superconducting qubits. Um, so people always ask me, how many qubits do we need to, to, to do this? And we did some calculations, but actually I recently a paper came out uh, simulating the results of the Google experiment. And they claimed they could do it like in a hundred like seconds or so. I don't remember the exact number. So I'm like a very, very uh, cautious of giving numbers because then some paper shows that they can simulate it easily. And, uh, but at, at surely at the least uh, it's, comparable to boson somethings in terms of the number of modes and number of uh, fermions that would be required. So uh, yeah, so this is what we have shown. Now some open problems and some thoughts about this. Like, well, well, first is anti-concentration at lower depth. So in the results we obtained in the paper, we obtained them anti-concentration for uh, linear depth. But uh, there's some work in random quantum circuits that show that we can get anti-concentration in log depth. And we believe that the same is the case in our setup actually. So we perform some very simple simulations. And um, so this is, this is, so to explain this, this, this plot, this, the y-axis is a constant that appears in the anti-concentration anti result. And the point is that, uh, the lower the depth you require for ob uh, obtaining this quantity, then the sooner you get anti-concentration. And what we show is that you can, it seems that log depth is, is possible for anti-concentration. Um, another thing we're interested in is uh, what about uh, applications for graphs? So, uh, I mean, these sampling schemes don't really have applications and people try to find applications for them. So people have found in Gaussian boson samplers applications to graph problems. Uh, we found that there are similar connections as in our case for active FLO. Uh, so there are connections to the coloring of graphs uh, or coloring of matchings. Uh, there, I will have to say though, it's not like real, real problems. They're more like toy problems, but still it's interesting because you could show, if you can show supremacy of sampling, then maybe you can show some like supremacy for some of these kind of problems. Also, what is its relation to chemistry problems? So as I mentioned before, there's work by Google uh, and the circuits they use are very similar to the ones we use in the, the fermion sampling scheme. So maybe some of the hardness guarantees that we find could translate into hardness guarantees for some chemistry problem. This is, and this is just a, uh, uh, some, some, uh, we don't have a specific results here. It's just something that could be in the future. Um, and something I'm interested as well that I've been thinking is about phase transitions in physical systems. So there is work that relates this sampling complexity to phase trans trans transitions in condensed matter. Uh, so in this paper, they do it for boson sampling. So the systems with bosons. Um, and they find that for certain regimes, the complexity of the sampling changes and this change, this, this signals changes of behavior. So, so since now we have fermion sampling, well, what does that tell us about uh, fermionic systems? That's also another question. Uh, so yeah, I think that's it for today. Thank you for your attention. Uh,